Our outline for our class, of course, as I said to the class yesterday, it's hard to believe that we're already um, this week and puts us halfway through the course. Um, today we are going to be looking at the first section of Exodus, the first 18 chapters, particularly the part of the book of Exodus that gives us the name Exodus, which is the uh, delivery from slavery in Egypt of the Israelites under Moses, leading up to their time of arrival at Mount Sinai. Next week we will be looking at the covenant at Sinai, when God actually gives the law through Moses, the law being his instruction for how they are to live in relationship to him. And then um, week six we will look at the book of Leviticus, Week 7, the book of Numbers. In week 8, we will spend the first hour looking at Deuteronomy, the second telling of the law before the entry into the promised land, and then the final exam. As I've told you, uh, around week 6, I will have for you our paper, our document, which says, here are the things you need to know from the class in the Pentateuch. Any questions about that? We're good? Have, haven't changed this one, so should, you should know what it is. We are, of course, looking at the first five books of the Old Testament in our class here. The Torah, as it's called in Hebrew, which means the law, or more appropriately, the instruction. Law to us uh, suggests more than nice. Oh, somebody lost all their boot. Oh, I know. It's very sad. My license for coming is still very sad. Yes. Use the, use the use the thirty second rule. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> what do you think? Yeah, how long is it? It was right on the edge. So uh, <laughs> the first five books of the Old Testament are called Torah in Hebrew, the Law of Instruction, Pentateuch in Greek, which is the of course uh, the five books or the five part book. That's what we're studying. Those books are Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. We've already dealt with Genesis in two classes. Today we begin with Exodus which relates God's deliverance of Israel uh, from Egypt and slavery in Egypt, and then the establishing of his covenant law. Um, this is a kind of a quick outline. I use this format when I do survey classes of uh, the book of Exodus. We believe, uh, we accept the traditional idea that Moses is the author, and it's, it's so shocking to me that you go online and, and look anything up, you know, you, you look for Exodus, or you, the book of Exodus, or the, the event of the Exodus, or whatever, and all they will say is, people used to think Moses wrote this, and that it was really, but nobody believes that anymore. And I'm going, excuse me, <laughs> right here, you know, and not just me. <laughs> I don't want you to think I'm the only one who believes that anymore, and if you go online and do research on this stuff, you might think that. There are a significant number of evangelical scholars who believe that there is as much academic and scholarly legitimacy to the belief that Moses was the author, as we talked about before, in the introduction of the Pentateuch, and, um, as that Moses was the author, that it was likely um, written sometime in the 15th century BC, 1446 to 1440, um, and that it is pretty much as we can read it. In fact, I, well, I'll get into that when we talk about a little bit of detail. The purpose of this book, the, whole, the key theme is redemption. God redeeming his people from slavery and then uh, reaffirming his commitment to them through the covenant uh, through Moses, the law. And it is, the purpose of the book is to show God's faithfulness to his covenant promise and to give directions for living. Of course, that covenant promise was the promise he gave originally. I mean, you could go back to the the. Adamic covenant, the promise he made to Adam and Eve. You can look at the Noahic covenant, but in particular, the Abrahamic covenant, where God said to Abraham and then his son Isaac and his son Jacob that you will be my special people, that you will, you will be the beginning of a people that I have set aside for myself. And the book of Exodus is how God steps in and demonstrates his commitment, his continuing, his eternal commitment, even from that point on, commitment to his covenant relationship with his people. And he fulfills that through redeeming them from slavery. So this is a book about redemption, about God's faithfulness to the covenant promise that he has made. Now, there's no real obvious way to break down or break up the book of Exodus the way there is Genesis. You remember in Genesis there are 10 different places 
where sections of the book are bridged by the Toledot formula, which says, and these are the generations, or this is the family, or this is the account of, depending on how you translate it. And it's an exact wording that gives you a bridge between sections in Genesis. There's no such literary indication of natural breaks in Exodus in the same way. All we can do is look at it topically. The first seven verses deal with Moses. The verses, uh, chapters I mean, uh, the chapters 7 through 13 deal with the plagues, that is the interaction between Moses and the Pharaoh. And then the Exodus itself, the actual uh, going out from Egypt, chapters 14 to 18, and then the actual giving of the law, chapters 19 to 24, and then the Israelites begin to live according to those new instructions, which is the establishment of the tabernacle and worship, uh, chapters 25 to 40. We today are going to be focusing on the first part of this book. As I say, there's no the, the, the two big events are the exodus from Egypt and the giving of the law. That's generally how people think of uh, exodus, even though there's no literary structure that allow you to do that like there is in Genesis. It's still valid to say that talk about the exodus and the, thing, the events surrounding that and talk about the giving of the law at Sinai, the, the Sinaic covenant as they sometimes call it. So we're going to deal today with the first three of these literary sections, or the first major grouping uh, the, that surrounded the exodus or the leaving from Egypt. Now, this is a sign that I took a picture of at um, the Monastery of St. John on the island of Patmos, where John the Apostle was imprisoned and where he wrote the book of Revelation. Um, and I wrote this because it tells you what exodus means. <laughs> it means exit. The top is Greek. Um, it's, and the Greek is epsilon, chi, <laughs> omicron, delta, omicron, sigma. Those are the letters. Transliterated, that is E-X-O-D-O-S, exodus, which means exit, or the, 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 the going out. And so there was this wonderful little sign in the monastery of Patmos that said, this way to the exodus, okay? This way to the exit. Salida. This way out, what's that? Salida. <laughs> Salida, Salida, right, it means Salida. Um, and so this is, um, you can translate, literate the Greek, as, again, there is a Hebrew name for exodus, which is the first words of the, of the book, but the name exodus is a Greek name, which was assigned when the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible was made, um, <coughs> 300 years before the time of Christ, almost 300 years, and this, so this is the name we know it by, Exodus, right? There, <clears throat> another way to look at the book is this little diagram, which I kind of like. Again, it deals with two big sections, although there's no literary break there. The first section being up to, uh, through the 18th chapter, the redemption from Israel, and then from there on, the revelation from God. Um, the divisions include in the first section the need for redemption, the fact that they're in slavery, the preparation for a redemption, especially the calling of Moses to be the one to, to bring the people out in God's instruction, the redemption of Israel, that is when they actually do leave after miraculous intervention by God with Pharaoh, and then the preservation of Israel, which has to do with the fact that God continued to care for them in the desert when they were having trouble, not having water, not having food, having people attacking them, God continue to preserve them. Once the revelation is given, which we'll look at next week, we have both the giving of the covenant, or revelation of the covenant, and then their response to it as they begin to implement it in the construction of the tabernacle. Um, the 430 years, which is listed here as the time, well, it wasn't 430 years from the time, it's 430 years from when it starts talking about the fact that there arose a Pharaoh who did not know Joseph, and they began to put the Israelites in under slavery, uh, forced labor, and then you've got Moses coming along, and Moses leaving, and Moses then aging 80 years or so, and then coming back, and then, so, when we say 430 years there, that's really 430 years since Joseph, because it has a real quick summary at the verse that says, okay, when last you saw the Israelites, Joseph had just died and everything was good. Now, 400, you know, almost 400 years later, here's where we find ourselves, and the Israelites are slaves now. Okay? And then two months of wandering around in the desert before they get to Sinai and deal with that, and then 10 months 
of receiving the law and then working to implement the law through the construction of the tabernacle, etc. We'll talk about those parts of it next week. It has been said that the book of Exodus may very well be the most important book in the Bible. Now, that wasn't a Christian that said that, it was a scholar. But the reason is because the book of Exodus defines the relationship that the nation of Israel has with God. In, well, it, it defines the, the renewal of the covenant commitment of God to the Israelites in the, in the departing from Egypt. But then the giving of the law through Moses the lawgiver. Moses is, um, in many ways, probably the most important figure to the Hebrew people in the Old Testament. Yes, you can say, well, Father Abraham you know, was the father of the nation, uh, or you could talk about King David making them great as a nation, but the one that really, uh, whereas Abraham was the father of them as a people, Moses was the father of them as a nation, because it was through Moses that God gave the law. Basically, the law is the constitution of the people of Israel. That's the thing that gave the people of Israel a structure as a people. And so the book of Exodus is where all that happens, where God renews his commitment and proves it by bringing them out throughout the whole rest of the Old Testament. Um, whenever anyone wants to speak to the fact that God is committed to the, to the Israelites, to the Jewish people, they say, you know, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, there's that patriarch, who brought us up out of slavery from the land of Egypt. That Exodus event became the keystone to the whole understanding the Hebrew people had to their relationship with God, probably more than any other thing. This is why Passover, which comes from the Exodus event, was um, for 1,500 years since then, uh, and probably even today, the most significant celebration in uh, the Jewish community, because it was the celebration of the time when God miraculously demonstrated in a very practical way his love for them and bringing them out of captivity in Egypt. So that event, and then the giving of the law later, which defined them as a nation, are, are I think, pretty strong reasons why it's legitimate to say that Exodus, certainly in terms of the Old Testament uh, presentation, is probably the most important book we have. Um, and in many ways, Exodus, it's legitimate, I believe, to see it as a Precursor. It's, a, it's a, um, an establishing of premises which then get completely fulfilled in Jesus. The whole things of redemption and things of that sort. We'll talk about that at the end of today. Um, the story, of course, well, we'll get into, get into that uh, with, with the actual passages. In terms of authorship, as I say, we hold, I hold, and I hope you do, to a traditional view that Moses was the author and again, you go online and you read stuff, and it says, um, I'll give you an example. As a matter of fact, it says, the Torah, which contains the story of the Exodus, was formed in the period of the Babylonian exile, 6th century BCE, or shortly after. That's 800 years later than what traditionally is maintained as being the date of the Exodus. And yet, it's, this comes from online. It's just stated as a fact. Okay. Uh, without any consideration that, well, there are people who disagree with that. You'll run into that a lot. And I think it's because people can't deal with the fact that God is real and he did miraculous things and he's still capable of it today. You know, that's not within most, pe most people in Western culture. That's not within their can, their ability to, to uh, take that in. And so they just discount it. They discard it without any... Anything to demonstrate that. There is no, it's not like they found archaeological proof that this was written in the, during the Babylonian exile in the 6th century BCE. There is no evidence for that. Somebody came up with a theory about the, based upon the different uses of the name of God, the documentary hypothesis, and then the theory about when those various writers were, and a theory about when the redactors put it all together, and it sounded so good, people started assuming it was, it was all true. And yet there's no evidence for any of that. Without some pretty concrete evidence, I don't think denying what for do some math here, what for over three thousand years was the understood source, the authorship, the timing, and everything else up until the nineteenth century, there had never been serious questions about that. And it's not because they found new evidence that suggested that it's not true. Somebody just started making stuff up in the nineteenth century, and then they decided that sounded so good they were going to believe it. There was no, it's not like, oh well, back, back before people had 
all of the new information we have now, there is no new information. There's no justification from a scholarly point of view for, for denying the traditional viewpoint, except people just think they're smarter than they really are. Not to put too fine a point on it. <laughs> um, well, if you, you know, if you, if you, if you marginalize that, then you can approach it with, with, as an option, not as truth. If you can, if you can, if you can undermine that, you know, mm -hmm. like higher criticism, does, then you can just approach it as an option. Uh, well, it is true that if we accept the fact that. Um, God acted miraculously in bringing the Hebrew people up out of slavery, if he acted miraculously in the plagues and the crossing of the Red Sea and everything else, then that obviously impinges upon our independence. Yeah. It means we no longer can act as though there is not a, a God above who has an opinion about things. And I think that's the biggest reason why people have difficulty with that. Okay? Yes? Uh, the, text, the textbook really describes two possible dates. And are you referencing either of those? Or just yes. Uh, the first of the dates, they talk about the 13th century option and the 15th century right. option. That is BC. Right. The more traditional view is the 15th century option, which is 1446 to 1400, okay? That 50-year that time period, 40 years in the desert, etc. And then it was the likelihood is that Moses actually wrote the, the Torah while they were in the desert and, you know, they weren't getting good TV reception, and so he had to do something in the evenings, and so he wrote this, this, uh, these books. Sorry about those silly things I say. Um, but, but, yeah, exactly. Um, the other option um, has been to think that it was in the 1200s. Now, that's the other still fairly conservative option. Um, William Albright, our, uh, who he based that upon some archaeological evidences that they had found uh, in that time, and this is the early 20th century, that they had found in Canaan that suggested to him a time period in which the Israelites actually appeared in Canaan. Well, some of those, uh, that archaeological evidence, for instance, he, they found these, uh, a particular kind of pot, which he, as an archaeologist, and probably the premier archaeologist of his day, attributed to the uh, Semitic people, the Israelite people, coming into Canaan. They brought it with them. Well, since Albright, they have found exactly those kind of pots, clearly from, you know, maybe 1,200 years earlier in Canaan. So there have been other discoveries since then. And so um, the, the main reason for the belief of the 1400s is because there are two places in Scripture. We'll get into the dating. Two places in Scripture, one in Exodus and one in Numbers, which says that there's a specific number of years, 430 years, uh, between the Exodus and the building of Solomon's Temple. Well, we know when Solomon's Temple was built. And those references are fairly specific, uh, 480 years, I think. And so do we accept that since it's very fairly specific? Some people have said, well, 480, the, you know, in Israel, we've talked about why are there so many 40s, why are there so many 3s, why are there, you know, because numbers meant something more than just accounting to the Hebrews, to most ancient peoples. Um, numbers had particular other meaning to them. Well, some people have said that 480 is simply the 12 tribes of Israel times 40, which was the, the, the reason 40. By the way, Bob, you asked this question before. Why 40 so much? 40 was seen as the ideal length of a generation. Okay, That's why they wandered 40 years in the desert, because that's how long it took for a generation to die out. So some people have said, well, 12 tribes of Israel, 40 years in a perfect generation, they just multiplied and came up with 480. So we can't rely on that, so let's look for something else. Well, really? Can we be that quick to just, somebody came up with that, oh, 480 is 12 times 40. Well, yeah, it always has been. <laughs> that doesn't mean 480 isn't a real number. Okay. And so the some of the things that that uh, 13th century option were based on, I think, have been invalidated. And you have to, you have to make excuses for several other things in scripture in order to go with that. So it could, it's possible. I mean, th there are other scholars who've looked at this and based upon evidence in Egypt, they think that it may have been 2300 BC and not 1400 BC, 700, um, you know, 900 years earlier. Someday we'll know all this. Um, but the point is that the people who say, oh, well, it wasn't written until the sixth century BC, which means 800 years later, it wasn't Moses. Somebody made it up. There wasn't, you know, the slaves 
did not leave Egypt. They didn't cross the Red Sea. None of this, well, it's because they start with the presumption that none of this extraordinary stuff could really have happened. And then they find excuses for why it doesn't. That's not the way honest thinking people should approach it. Now, it could have been the 13th century, the 1200s. Our faith is not broken either way. The problem is if you push it all the way to the 600s, then you violate so much of the rest of Scripture that's based upon this. Okay? Then we have a fundamental problem. You might as well throw it all out you know, and become a Jehovah's Witness or something. You know, <laughs> because it doesn't make any sense anymore. You know, it really doesn't. Um, in other words, find somebody else who interprets it their own way anyway. I mean, you know, it doesn't matter at that point. Okay? All right. There are a number of major events that I want us to look at through uh, Exodus. The first one is setting the stage. This is the first chapter, starting with the eighth verse. This describes to us what we're dealing with. The oppression of the Israelites. Then a new king, or Pharaoh, which is what they called him in Egypt, who did not know about Joseph, came to power in Egypt. Look, he said to his people, the Israelites have become much too numerous for us. Come, we must deal shrewdly with them, or they will become even more numerous, and if war breaks out, we'll join our enemies, fight against us, and leave the country. Okay, I want to stop here, because I want to point out one of the examples of how people just, you know, MSU. Carolyn and I use that expression. It means make stuff up. Okay? Here when it says, the Pharaoh says we must deal shrewdly with the Israelites. They will become even more numerous, and if war breaks out, we'll join our enemies, fight against us, and leave the country. Liberal scholars have said, well, the Pharaoh would never have said that, because at this time in history, and then they argue about what time in history it was, at this time in history, Egypt didn't have any serious competitors. And so they wouldn't have been afraid about anybody attacking them, because Egypt was the power in the whole known world at that time. Well, really, how do you think they got to be the only real power in the known world? And how many years was it before there were really, you know, people who were fighting against them? The Assyrians, the Babylonians, etc. It is not unreasonable, even if Egypt was in a time of peace and the most powerful country in the world, for the Pharaoh to still realize somebody could come along at some point and challenge us. And we need to be aware of that possibility or else they would have just disbanded the whole military and forgot the whole thing. Okay. So, that's an example to me of exactly how flights of fancy among scholars, and then they decide, well, no, this couldn't really happen because the Pharaoh would never have said that. How do you know? I'm feeling a little cynical today about people like that, sorry. I'll smile and things will be better, okay? Um, so, now to verse 11. So they put slave masters over them to oppress them with forced labor, and they built Pithom and Ramesses as store cities for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread. So the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites and work them ruthlessly. They made their lives bitter with hard labor in bricks and mortar and with all kinds of work in the field. In all their hard labor, the Egyptians used them ruthlessly. There that word is again. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, whose names were Shifra and Pua, when you help the Hebrew women in childbirth and observe them on the delivery stool, if it is a boy, kill him. But if it is a girl, let her live. One of my very favorite things about this, this first part of Exodus is Shifra and Pua, two simple Hebrew midwives. They helped Hebrew women have their babies. Their names have come down to us almost 3,500 years later as two women who were obedient to God even when senior authorities in the country had said no. And I love the fact that we know their names. Okay. Um, the story goes on from here, as I'm sure you may recall, that uh, Shifra and Pua didn't go along with the, the tale. They refused to kill the baby boys. And so, um, and when the, when the Pharaoh, you know, and it may have been his Officials. It may not have actually been him. I don't think he did all the talking here. When the officials called these two women and said, what, what are you doing? There are still Israelite boys being born, Hebrew boys being born, and you're not killing them. They go, oh, we're really sorry, but, you know, the, the Hebrew women are not weak like you Egyptian women. <laughs> they are working out in the field, and they just drop their kids right there and then go back to work. They, don't, they, they have the babies before we can even get there. 
So we can't do anything about it because by the time we get there, they've already had them because they're so much stronger than you weak Egyptian women. Okay. Love that story. <laughs> and so the determination is made that the Pharaoh is going to have to be a little more aggressive. He's going to have to do something to, um, to actually kill the boys. And so he's, he orders his soldiers that when they find Hebrew baby, male babies, throw them in the Nile River. Okay. Um, another one of the sort of massacre of the innocent, innocence kind of things that we find occurring in several places in Scripture. So that's where we find ourselves. The Israelites have become, become numerous enough, the Pharaoh is, is afraid of them. And this is a Pharaoh who doesn't remember. There used to be the, the nominal head of the Hebrew people named Joseph who saved Egypt from famine and really made them great because they were the only country that had food because he was wise in reserving it and then selling it and they made so much money that's one of the things that made Egypt so great is they were wealthy when most of the other countries around them became impoverished during the time of Joseph because they had to give all their money to Joseph and Egypt in order to be able to eat. Okay. So we move on. Now a man of the house of Levi married a Levite woman and she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. When she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. Remember, by this time, the soldiers of Pharaoh are looking for male babies to throw them in the Nile. But when she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and coated it with tar and pitch. Then she placed the child in it and put it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile. His sister, who we know from later, his name is Miriam, stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. Then Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe, and her attendants were walking along the riverbank. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her slave girl to get it. She opened it and saw the baby. He was crying, and she felt sorry for him. This is one of the Hebrew babies, she said. And the story goes on here that when the, the Pharaoh's daughter has just seen this baby, Miriam, Moses' older sister, runs up to her and goes, would you like for me to find a Hebrew um, wet nurse to nurse the baby for you? Miriam was very smart. She didn't give, Mir uh, give Pharaoh's daughter the opportunity to think, what am I going to do with this baby? Miriam rushes up and says, I can facilitate your keeping this beautiful little boy. And she goes, do that. That's good. And in one of those great ironies, Miriam goes and gets her mother, Moses' mother, who is still with milk because she gave birth to this boy just three months earlier. And so Moses' own mother ends up being his wet nurse. And during the time that he's growing up, and then Pharaoh's daughter takes Moses into her own house and raises him as a prince, a prince of the Egyptians. Okay? Um, so this is the birth and preservation of Moses, uh, a miraculous kind of intervention there. Now, so Moses grows up, very well educated, has all the best in the world. He is a prince in the house of the richest and most powerful ruler in the known world at that time, in the house of Pharaoh. We move forward. Moses has grown up. One day, after Moses had grown up, <laughs> he went out to where his own people were and watched them at their hard labor. So Moses was told at some point who he was. Whether it was by his mother, who's the wet nurse, or his sister, who's, who's always hanging around watching, or by his uh, adopted mother, the daughter of Pharaoh. He was raised as a prince, but was told at some point, you are Hebrew. He went out to where his own people were and watched them at their hard labor. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people. Glancing this way and that and seeing no one, he killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. The next day he went out and saw two Hebrews fighting. He asked the one in the wrong, why are you hitting your fellow Hebrew? The man said, who made you ruler and judge over us? Actually, Pharaoh's daughter did, but that's beside the point. Who made you ruler and judge over us? Are you thinking of killing me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and thought, what I did must have become known. When Pharaoh heard of this, he tried to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh and went to live in Midian, where he sat down by a well. Wouldn't Moses have known he was a Hebrew because he was circumcised? Well, uh, possibly. <laughs> the, interestingly enough, um, Moses 
almost certainly was circumcised, but it appears that he did not circumcise his, his first two sons, or at least one of his first two sons, because we have this very weird little incident later where, where Moses seems to be tooling along just fine with God, and then it says, and then God determined to kill Moses. And then Moses' wife, Zipporah, who was not a Hebrew, she was Midianite, um, she circumcises one of their sons, and then you takes that and touches Moses' it says takes the foreskin and touches Moses' feet. Quite often in scripture, just so you know, feet is a euphemism for genitals. When it talks about the cherubim having four sets of wings, with one set they cover their eyes, and with one, with one set they cover their feet, that means covered their genitals, their private parts. Feet was a euphemism. So apparently uh, Moses had not been obedient to Mosaic law, had not <laughs> Um, circumcised. What's that? It wasn't Mosaic Law at that point. <laughs> no, what I call it? You said Mosaic Law. The Abrahamic Covenant, not Mosaic Law. The Abrahamic Covenant. And had not circumcised his son. And then um, his wife, apparently, he had explained to her how this was supposed to work and that they hadn't done what they should have done. She sort of saves Moses from God's wrath because uh, Moses apparently had not been doing a very good job of raising his sons the way a Jewish man should have. Okay? Uh, it's a very weird little incident, okay? But he, 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 almost certainly Moses would have been circumcised. So, yeah, probably, I hadn't thought about that, but that probably was one I didn't know. I'm sure you guys have a yeah. question. <laughs> hey, yeah. Mom, why am I so different? <laughs> <Hey>. <laughs> well, the other little naked boy's running around looking different than me, and I'm not quite sure why. Okay. Um, so, Pharaoh, remember Pharaoh, and we believe this is still the same Pharaoh that had tried to kill the babies. <laughs> He was still ruling. He was scared of the Israelites anyway. His daughter managed to sort of pull one over on him and raise this Hebrew um, in, in their household. And yet he probably wasn't too sure about him because he was one of the enemy, basically, and was being raised with privilege in his house, the Pharaoh's house. And so at some point when he finds out that Moses had actually committed murder on behalf of the Hebrews, against an Egyptian, it's like the Pharaoh said, that's it, that's enough, no more, you're out of here, you know, and he goes after him to, to prosecute him for murder, which means to execute him. The Pharaoh, if he decided that somebody had done something wrong, he didn't have to go to trial with him, you know, he just did whatever he wanted. Um, so, we have Moses fleeing and going to Midian, now there's some some disagreement about where exactly in terms of a place Midian was. Some people maintain that it was the south, uh, southern and eastern part of the Sinai Peninsula, which would have been east of Egypt, on the other side of um, the uh, Gulf of Suez. Okay. Some people maintain that it was more likely that Midian was on the other side of the Gulf of Aqaba, meaning in Saudi Arabia. One reason for that being there, there seems to be an indication that the Egyptians, the Egyptians controlled all of the Sinai Peninsula. It wasn't part of Egypt, but they controlled it all. And yet there was a suggestion that they didn't, they weren't active. There were not Egyptian troops or, or the Egyptians were not active in Midian the whole time that, that Moses was there. And we're going to talk about later where, um, where Red Sea crossing, where the Mount Sinai was, because there's some question about that. And so Midian was either the southern and eastern part of the Sinai Peninsula, again, which is across from the Gulf of Suez, which is, there's, the Red Sea has two arms that stick up, okay? The, the, if you're looking at it this way, the, the one on the eastern side is the Gulf of Suez, the one on the, right, the western side is the Gulf of Aqaba. In between those two is the Sinai Peninsula. On the western side of the Gulf of Suez is Egypt. On the eastern side of the Gulf of Aqaba is Saudi Arabia. So the question is, if you've got the Gulf of Suez and the Gulf of Aqaba, is the, this is going to look great on camera. Um, <laughs> was Midian here in the Sinai Peninsula that, that's in between the two, or was it over here in Saudi Arabia where Egypt never did really have control? Okay, There's a question about that. Does that make sense? See what we're saying? You're going to see a map of that. A little bit later. I should have put one in here, but didn't think about doing that. Okay. Um, so Moses um, heads out, goes to Midian, sits down, and in a story very similar to Jacob, 
Women come to you know, water their uh, animals at the well. He meets a woman, uh, Zipporah. He then meets Jethro, who was a priest of the Midianites. And he ends up marrying Zipporah, becoming the son-in-law and the head shepherd for Jethro. Jethro comes into the story later. Apparently he was a very wise man. But because he's running from Egypt, he needs a gig, he needs a job, he needs some place to live, he becomes part of Jethro's family and starts working for him. And so the next scene we have is the call. Oh, I'm sorry, I skipped one here. Uh, the burning bush. Moses has been taking care of Jethro's <laughs> flocks for many, many years by this time. And we have in Exodus 3. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. Now we don't know if that's the Arabian desert or the, the desert of the Sinai. Okay. We're not sure which desert we're talking about here. Again, depends upon where Midian is. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange light, why this bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Remember that? That's how God identifies himself. Uh, always, up until the, uh, later on, he gives to Moses, he gives his proper name. That we'll talk about. But still, periodically, he'll refer to himself or others will refer to him as the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. The famous burning bush. This, um, this manifestation of God, or a theophany, to use the word for it, theophany means an appearance by God, or a deity. I mean, the, the Greeks use the word theophany as well. Um, but the idea of God appearing, God showing up in person. So in this burning bush, the bush that did not, was not consumed, Moses had a face-to-face, -face, a personal experience with God. Face-to-face, -face, not exactly, because God doesn't have a face, but the immediate presence of God in the theophany. And so Moses hides his face and basically is saying, all right, what do you want with me? And we have the call of Moses. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go. I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you, and this will be a sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. This was holy ground. Moses said to God, Suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, What is his name? Then what shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent you. This is the introduction. Although the word is used in text earlier, this is the place, because Moses, we believe, wrote the early books, um, later on than this, but Moses wrote them. The proper name of God that is given here is Yahweh. Now remember that Hebrew, ancient Hebrew, modern Hebrew for that matter, does not have any vowels when it's written. Ancient languages didn't have vowels when they were written because vowels are only used for pronunciation. Vowels are breathing sounds, a, e, a, o, u. Well, you don't need breathing sounds when you're just writing something, and so ancient languages especially had no vowels. They were only consonants. So the, when God says, I am who I am in Hebrew, that is Y-H-W-H. I am. Now, we believe that the likelihood is that it was pronounced Yahweh in Hebrew, 
that the vowels would have been, you know, A and E kind of thing in there. Um, I think I've told you all this before, not in this class, but because there were no vowels in written Hebrew, but when they were teaching young people, especially boys, to read in public, to read scripture in public, they had to teach them how to pronounce the words because they didn't, didn't know early on. And so they would put in the margins, whenever you had a, um, a noun with just consonants written, they would put vowel points, a series of dots that represented the different vowels. Well, because the Hebrews were not allowed to pronounce the name of the proper name of God, Yahweh, they instead would say Adonai whenever they came to that in the text. A young man was taught, if you're reading along in the Hebrew Bible, it would be this way because it's right to left. Reading along in the Hebrew Scripture, you get to this proper name, and instead of saying Yahweh, you say Adonai, Lord. It's a generic word. And because that's what they taught them to say, the vowel points were for Adonai, not for Yahweh. Somewhere along the line, somebody made a mistake. And they took the, the consonants from Yahweh and the vowel points for Adonai, and they put them together and created the word Jehovah. There is no such word as Jehovah. It doesn't mean there's anything fundamentally wrong with using it, but Jehovah is not a real word. It's the consonants from Yahweh and the vowel points from Adonai put together. Okay? So, God's proper name, I am who I am, or simply, I am, sent you. It's very interesting here that Moses has a theophany, a, an appearance by God to his presence, and gives him instructions, and all Moses can do is find excuses. Now, we have two of them here. Actually, Moses has uh, four excuses and then one final statement to try to deny the call of God. The first one is inadequacy. Who am I to go to the Pharaoh? That's here. And the second one, ignorance. Well, if I go to the people of Israel and they ask me, what is his name who sent you? What do I tell them? Tell them that I am, Yahweh has sent you. But it goes on from this passage. The next one is incredibility. Like uh, and Moses says, but, but they will not believe me or listen to my voice. For they will say, the Lord did not appear to you. They won't believe me. And then, inarticulateness. Moses says, but the Lord, I'm not eloquent. You know, I am slow of speech and of tongue. I don't talk well. And then the last one, each time God responds, each time a long-suffering God takes the time to answer Moses in, instead of just smacking him upside his head. <laughs> he answers the objections. And each time the answer is basically, look, you're not going by yourself. I'm going to be there. You're not doing this by your own power. I will, I will make it happen for you. Finally, in the fourth chapter, the 13th verse, Moses said, Lord, please, I pray you, send somebody else. And God said, okay, that's enough. <laughs> Go. I will send Aaron, your brother, who does speak well. He will be your voice. But you are my man. And you are to go. And so finally, I'm sure his head hung down and his tail between his legs, Moses says, okay, I'll go. Later on, he gains more confidence as God demonstrates the very significant power that he plans to make available to Moses as he goes along. But Moses argues in every way possible that he is not adequate to do this job God has called him to. And that's very important, I think, for us because we have to see that when God calls us to something, he never leaves us without the resources, no matter how weak we may think we are. And in fact, to demonstrate his willingness to support Moses, God gives um, seven very powerful statements that begin with, I will. First, God says here, I am. Then, he says, I will bring you out. Not you have to do it. I will bring you out. Then he says, I will deliver you. Then he says, I will redeem you, speaking of the Israelites through Moses. All three of those I will statements reflect God's commitment to redeem the Israelites, to redeem the people. Then he says, um, I will take you for my people. And then he says, I will be your God. You will be my people, I will be your God. These are the I wills of adoption. 
first three, I will redeem you and bring you out. The second time God says I will has to do with adoption. I will be your God, you will be my people. And then he gives two more. I will settle you into the land, I will give it to you for possession. These promises of the land, of the settlement into the land. So seven times God says to Moses, be clear Moses, I'm there for you. I will bring you out. I will deliver you. I will redeem you. I will take you for my people. I will be your God. I will bring you into the land. I will give it to you for a possession because I am the Lord. So he brackets those seven I will statements with his declaration that he is the Lord. That's the authority by which he's going to do all these things. And so Moses agrees um, and moves forward. Okay. Any questions about any of that? <clears throat> I question. um, I'm confused. Um, Mount Horeb and Mount Sinai, are they the same? Yes. And where are they? Well, there's a question about that. I mean, talk if, you, if you go today and you took a tour in Israel, it would be at the southern tip of Sinai. Right. But, but there's... A lot of people don't think... The, do you know who chose um, that location, which is called Jebel Musa, which means the mountain of Moses? who selected that as the site of Mount Sinai? St. Helena, Constantine's mother. When she went to the Holy Land and found the real cross and identified where Jesus was born exactly and where the, you know, Jesus was crucified exactly, the mother of Constantine, the first emperor who allowed Christianity to exist in the empire and not be illegal, went to the Holy Land and she made all these decisions. And St. Helena was the one who said, this is Mount Sinai. And everybody went, okay. Yes, ma'am, <laughs> mother of Constantine, the emperor of the whole Roman Empire. And that's been the traditional site ever since. But there's no evidence for that. And where's the other optional evidence? I'll talk about that. I'm going to talk about the whole Exodus and Sinai thing in a minute. So you just have to wait. <laughs> we'll get you there. Okay. Um, so Moses is obedient. He goes to Pharaoh to talk to Pharaoh, to convince him to let my people go. And of course that theme, let my people go, has been a powerful theme down through human history since then. From the Israelites uh, to, to any time there have been people who have been oppressed, particularly the, in the time of slavery in the United States, and again echoed in the Civil Rights Movement, the idea of letting my people go, let my people out of slavery. There's some wonderful, wonderful uh, black spirituals about, you know, uh, when Israel was in Egypt, land, let my people go. You know, you know the songs. So uh, it's a beautiful theme. So Moses goes to the Pharaoh and says, God says, let my people go. Actually, what he says at first is, God has told us to come out into the desert and worship him, and so we need to go out in the desert. And Pharaoh says, no. And then he goes, no, really, God wants us to go out in the desert. He said, okay, well, you can go, but the people have to stay here. And he goes, no, 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 God wants us all to go. Well, okay, the men can go, but the women and children and stuff need to stay here. And they have this, this like argument back and forth. And then Moses said, no, we all have to go. And Pharaoh says, okay, the people can go, but you have to leave all your animals here. And Moses says, no, we have to offer sacrifices. We have to have all of our herds because we don't know which, which animals God will choose for sacrifice. And there's this thing going on, this back and forth, negotiating how far is Pharaoh willing to go. And then finally Pharaoh says, no, you can't go. And Moses says, you know, you shouldn't have said that. Because God is intent on us leaving, and he will now show you his power. And we have the series of ten plagues on Egypt that God uh, presents. It's important to know, before I get into the details of these plagues, that the real um, the, a key to understanding what's happening to Pharaoh here goes back to uh, chapter 5, the second verse, two chapters before we actually have them. When Moses is talking to Pharaoh and saying, you know, the Lord God is telling us to do that, and Pharaoh says, I do not know the Lord. In other words, that's not my God. I don't know anything about this. So no, I'm not going to let you do it. That issue of knowing the Lord, knowing God, you may never have noticed it, but then that gets echoed over and over again, all the way from chapter the start of chapter 6 through chapter 14, that it's almost as though Pharaoh said, I don't know this, Lord. And God said, you're going to know me. 
Chapter 6, verse 7 says, And you, Israel, first, shall know that I am the Lord your God. And then chapter 7, And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. Verse 17 of 7, But this you, Pharaoh, shall know that I am by this, you, Pharaoh, shall know that I am the Lord. Chapter 8, verse 10, That you, Pharaoh, may know that there is no one like the Lord our God. Verse 22 of chapter 8, That you, Pharaoh, may know that I am the Lord in the midst of the earth. Chapter 9, verse 14, I will send all my plagues that you, Pharaoh, may know that there is none like me in all the earth. Chapter 9, verse 29, I, Moses, will stretch out my hands that there will be no more hail, and you, Pharaoh, may know that the earth is the Lord's. Chapter 10, verse 2, that you, Moses and Israel, may tell what signs I, the Lord, have done among them, the, is the Egyptians, that you may know that I am the Lord. Chapter 11, verse 7, and that you, Moses, and Israel may know that the Lord makes a distinction between the Egyptians and Israel. Chapter 14, verse 4, and I will get glory over Pharaoh, and the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord, having to do with crossing the sea. And chapter 14, verse 18, and the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I have gotten glory over Pharaoh, over his chariots, and his horsemen. Not only Pharaoh, but also <coughs> Moses and the Israelites. You will know, you will know, you will know, you will know, you will know. So you didn't know? By the time we're done, you're going to know. And it's very important to understand that because that the, the, this importance, the significance of that uh, constant repetition of the I'm going to make sure you know helps us understand why there was first a, why there were ten plagues, and why Pharaoh's heart was hardened. Because if there had been one plague and Pharaoh went, oh wow, I messed up, go ahead guys, then there would not have been the sense of, of weight and significance and power, demonstrated power, that came this way. I'm going to talk about the hardening of the heart in a minute, okay, and how, how all that worked. Most people don't understand how it is that Pharaoh's heart was hardened. But this idea of knowing that God is God, that He is the God over the earth, that He controls everything, and that He can cause calamity or relieve calamity as He wishes, so that we may know that He is the Lord God. Okay. So the plagues that come, after Pharaoh finally absolutely says, absolutely not, get out of my sight, Moses, we're not going to talk about this anymore, I'm tired of debating this with you, you're not going. We have the Nile turned to blood, Pharaoh still says no. There is a plague of frogs that come up out of the Nile River, and it says they are in every household. They're in people's beds. They're everywhere. The frogs go away. And periodically in here, Pharaoh will begin, will, will suggest, oh, well, okay, well, maybe so. And so, Moses says, fine, if you feel that way, then, and then the problem leaves, and Pharaoh says, no, 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 I'm not going to let you go. And the next plague comes. Plague three was of lice and gnats. Plague four is flies. Plague five is disease on the cattle and livestock. Plague six, bores, uh, boils and sores, both on people and on animals. Plague number seven is hail, lightning and thunder and hail that destroys the crops and the animals that were left outside. Now, interestingly enough, these, um, the Israelites who lived in Goshen in one area these plagues did not affect them. They did not have the hail. They did not have the frogs. They did not have the lice and gnats or the flies or anything else. It didn't affect them where they were, but the whole rest of the land of Egypt were told. Then locusts come to destroy the crops. And then plague nine, darkness for three days. And then the final one, the death of the firstborn, which we will talk about in a second. There's a lot of cons consideration that's been made over the years about these plagues and why these particular plagues. One of the theories that has been uh, put forward quite often is that these plagues were specifically intended as an affront to the religious beliefs of the pharaohs. Because most, I mean, there are a few of these that are pretty obviously linked to Egyptian gods or goddesses. A couple of them you have to kind of strain. But, for instance, the first, um, the, the water turned to blood, and that was the water in the Nile and in other ponds and everything else. I mean, there wasn't any clean water. They were digging holes along the Nile to try to get down to find fresh water. Well, one of the gods of the Egyptians was Hapi, who was the god of the Nile, the bringer of fertility. And so the idea of the Nile being polluted <coughs> is a slap in the face of one of the Egyptian gods. The second of the Egyptian gods that may have been referred to here is the goddess Hek, who was the frog-headed goddess of fruitfulness. 
some, somebody was running out of, of images for gods, I think. But uh, Heck was the frog-headed goddess. Then there was, uh, the third one is where we strain a little bit, I think. Kephara was the, the god that was in the form of a beetle. You've seen scarabs, right? Yes. These scarab symbols that are Egyptian, because one of their gods represented those beetles that were common in that part of the world. Also, the possibility is there that might, that, that might have been included in the swarm of flies kind of thing, that the goddess uh, Kephara symbolized the daily cycle of the sun across the sky. Then you have a number of Egyptian gods and goddesses that were in the form of cattle. For instance, Hathor. It's believed that when the, uh, when the Israelites got to the foot of Mount Sinai and Moses up on the mountain for a while and they built the golden calf, that may have actually been, they were, they were hearkening back to Hathor having been the cow goddess of Egypt and that they were recreating that Egyptian worship. Then, and, and there are several others. Then, in terms of the, the hail, Nut was the sky goddess and the protector of the dead. So anything that came from the sky was supposed to be from Nut. Serapia was the protector from locusts. So a locust swarm over Egypt would have been a direct affront to the idea that they had a goddess that was supposed to protect them from that. Locusts were a horrendous thing. A swarm of locusts, you, you may have read about this or whatever, but a swarm of locusts could destroy everything green as far as you could see. The sky would turn black with these bugs. We don't have any concept of that anymore. Um, then um, Ray was the personification of the sun, so that three days of darkness would have been an affront to that god. And then Taurt was the goddess of maternity who presided over childbirth and protected the household, and so the death of the firstborn. Each of these, a couple of them were straining, but it's, it, it may be legitimate that each one of these would have, each one of the plagues would have been an affront to some particular Egyptian deity or religious belief. And there is some scriptural reference to that. Exodus 12, 2, the Lord says, And on all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. And in Numbers 33, 4, it says, For the Lord has brought judgment on all of their, the Egyptians' gods. So there are a couple of references that suggest there may have been an intention there. But... It does not say in Scripture, the Bible doesn't say, that each of these plagues was intended to be an affront to one of the Egyptian gods or a demonstration of the, the inadequacy of the Egyptian deities. Uh, but it's interesting. Another thing that I have heard dealt with quite a bit is the suggestion that each one of the um, plagues, starting with um, the, the Nile turned red as blood, could have been a red algae bloom, which kills uh, fish and things because it takes all the oxygen out of the water. And so it would have driven the frogs out of the water. Fish can't get out of the water, but frogs can. So the red algae bloom denying all the oxygen in the water, the frogs would have left. And because the, the, um, the fish would have died, they were in the lake, and it says, you know, the, the fish died, then that would have caused uh, maggots and flies and, you know, gnats and all kinds of other bad things. That that, with all the flies that were around, that then could have caused some flyborne diseases on the cattle which would have lead, led to boils or sores. I've heard very specific explanations related to all of this. Um, that doesn't explain how hail happened, you know, uh, but we, it's possible that God had this sort of chain of natural events that he set off, starting with a red algae bloom. It, just because that may have been the way it worked would not indicate that God's hand wasn't in it. We believe this was a miraculous act of God, however he happened to implement it. Uh, but however it happened, we got to the ninth plague, and each time Pharaoh, as I say, especially later on, he would start to give in, and then they would you know, ease up, and then Pharaoh's heart, heart, heart would harden again, and we would come to the Passover. Before I get into the, the, uh, the Passover, let me talk about the hardening of Pharaoh's heart a little bit. There are 20 different references in uh, Exodus about Pharaoh's heart being hardened. 20 different times. Um, and I'm not going to read all of those to you because you don't need to hear that. But it's most people think, but God says fairly early, I will harden the heart of Pharaoh and he will not let you go so that my glory will be demonstrated. That's sort of what, what I was suggesting a minute ago, that the more this thing built up, the more God's power was demonstrated to the eventuality that Pharaoh had to give in. And so the power of God was demonstrated so that Pharaoh would know, would know, would know, would know that this was God. Um, 
Well, while God says early on, I will harden the heart of Pharaoh, the uh, first half of the times it talks about Pharaoh's heart being hardened, it wasn't God that does it. It says Pharaoh's heart is hardened. He hardened, that is Pharaoh, hardened his heart. Pharaoh's heart was hardened, but Pharaoh hardened his heart, but the heart of Pharaoh was hardened. There's always a sense either that Pharaoh is doing it or that it's just sort of a natural reaction to something, but it doesn't specifically say that God is doing it. The, the, finally, in chapter 9, it says, but the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh. Then we have two more references where Pharaoh hardened his own heart. And then the last four references, I have hardened his heart, but the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. Again, the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. And the last time, uh, chapter 11, the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. The suggestion is that Pharaoh was determined to harden his heart in the first place. And he did it himself. And almost as judgment for that, God eventually at some point said, fine, we're going to take this to its conclusion. And I'm not, you're not going to have the option even of giving in until my full power is demonstrated. That's a very biblical uh, idea in the New Testament. It talks about the fact that if we reject or deny God, we may actually lose the ability to come back. I used the analogy in a sermon not too long ago. It's almost as though if we are absolutely insistent we're going to run away from home, we may not be able to find our way back again. And so there is a biblical example of that, that if we choose to harden our hearts to deny God, God may cut off from us the opportunity then to recognize Him or to return to Him. That's, that's a possibility. And that, I think, is what happened with Pharaoh. He started out hardening his own heart. And then God said, fine then. We're going to carry this through so that you see, so that you know that I truly am the Lord of all the earth. Mary? Is that like blasphemy against the Holy Spirit? Because at some point he knew and wouldn't accept and just kept pushing away. That, that could have been part of it. I think Pharaoh, uh, Pharaoh's problem was that there are places where he really is back and forth. You know, he gives in. Because he's seen God's power, and then the minute the thing goes away, like yeah, the hail is an example, there's all this hail falling, and Pharaoh says, okay, okay, okay. And then Moses actually says, well, to prove, to, so that you may know that the Lord is over all the earth, I will cause the hail to stop, and we can move forward from here. And then after the hail stops and everything, then Pharaoh says, well, no, wait a minute. I take it back. So he was waffling, and some of it was his own pride. Who wants to give into that? You know, who wants to, who, he's the ruler of the strongest empire that had ever been. No competitors. Wealthy, educated, they had everything. Um, and then these slaves are telling me what to do and claiming that the one true God is the one behind it all. That's a, I'm not sure I'm going to take that from you. Thank you very much. And so you get his pride wrapped up in that. It's, it's a complicated, some of it's spiritual, some of it's psychological, you know, having to do with his pride and position and everything else. Um, but because of all that, it really does ring true to me. Because that's the way people act. Bob? I've noticed that some of these plagues have persisted in the present day and the COVID pandemic. <laughs> Especially the flies, right? Yeah, yeah I, was, I was thinking about that too. Yeah, the plague of flies. We, we know that God is the Lord of the universe, and so why does he keep telling us this? Um, well, the last plague was the death of the firstborn, the ultimate plague. And it was the thing that both was the final straw in having Pharaoh release them, and it was also to become the mark of the greatest acknowledgement of God's miraculous intervention on the part of the Hebrews, the thing that started the Passover season and the Passover celebration from that time till today. And it is from Exodus 14. First, God instructs Moses on all this stuff. Again, I, I try to keep it on one slide. And then Moses turns around and instructs the elders of Israel on all the things God has told him to do to get ready for this. So I pick it up after God has instructed Moses in the first part of chapter 12, and when Moses is then turning around and telling the Israelites. I think you've gone a slide yeah. too far. Oh, I'm sorry. Huh. It's missing. It's missing. I, I think I know what I did. I added this, and I thought I added it before I copied it, but apparently I didn't. So you're just going to have to listen. <laughs> <laughs> Chapter 12, beginning with the 21st verse. Then Moses summoned all the elders of Israel and said to them, Go at once and select the animals for your families and slaughter the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop, which is a sort of like parsley, 
looking. It's a bushy herb. Take a bunch of hyssop, dip it in the blood in the basin, and put some of the blood on the top and on both sides of the door frame. None of you shall go out from the door of your house until morning. When the Lord goes through the land to strike down the Egyptians, he will see the blood on the top and sides of the door frame and will pass over that doorway. That's where we get Passover. He will pass over that doorway and he will not permit the destroyer to enter your houses and strike you down. Obey these instructions as a lasting ordinance for you and your descendants. When you enter the land that the Lord has given you as his promise, observe this ceremony. And when your children ask you, what does this ceremony mean to you? Then tell them, it is the Passover sacrifice to the Lord who passed over the houses of the Israelites in Egypt and spared our homes when he struck down the Egyptians. Then the Lord bowed, the people bowed down and worshipped. The Israelites did just what the Lord commanded Moses and Aaron. At midnight, the Lord struck down all the firstborn in Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on the throne, to the firstborn of the prisoner who was in the dungeon, and the firstborn of all the livestock as well. Pharaoh and all his officials and all the Egyptians got up during the night, and there was loud wailing in Egypt, for there was not a house without someone dead. The ultimate. Now, right before this, uh, this, right before this passage I just read, God had given instruction to Moses, and he said, take one lamb, spotless lamb, for each family, and if, um, if necessary, you know, if it's small families, then one lamb for two families, share if you have to. Slaughter the lamb, save its blood, roast the lamb, all of it, head, entrails, everything over a fire, and eat it all tonight. Anything that you don't eat, burn. Make unleavened bread. Don't use any yeast because you don't have time to let it rise. Was the theme there? Okay. Yeast, you have to yeast bread. You have to sit around, let it rise. Make unleavened bread. Eat the roasted lamb and the unleavened bread with your sandals on, your staff in your hand, and your robe tucked into your belt, meaning ready to go. You're ready to go out the door. The whole message here was you're about to leave. Get ready for this. Be ready to walk out the door right now. You know, you're ready to go. Eat your stuff, eat the, eat the lamb, eat the unleavened bread, eat it all. Anything you don't eat, burn it because you're not, gonna, you're not coming back. Okay? So that was the message that then, I keep pointing this, that then led to um, the, the blood of the lamb was brushed on the doorpost and lentil, and that was a sign that the destroyer. It doesn't actually say the angel of death. People often talk about the angel of death. That's not, that doesn't say that in Scripture. But it says God was coming through, and then it refers to the destroyer. And so the idea that the blood of the lamb saved the people from destruction, mm -hmm. does that yes. have a particular ring to you? Jesus. That symbolism got fulfilled in Jesus, the Passover lamb. There's a reason why Jesus' sacrifice occurred at the Passover in the New Testament. We're going to take a break. Any questions about that? Would, would it be too far-fetched to consider that maybe um, these plagues had a real powerful impact on the Jews that lived there? I mean, these are people that Moses said, they're not going to believe me. They're not going to believe what I said. You know? So uh, would, it be, would it be proper to consider that each one of these plagues really opened the eyes of Israel to see they were a distinct people. They lived under this bondage for 400 years. They were used to taskmasters right. telling them more bricks, more bricks, more bricks. That was their lifestyle. And now here comes Moses with this alternative uh, reality that he presents on behalf of a God that they are not real, you know, familiar yeah. with. So I would think that maybe these miracles had a real profound impact on them. Well, yes, except they were very quick to get impatient with Moses. Um, for instance, when Moses first gets there, Moses and Aaron, they demonstrate God's presence by doing basically magic tricks, you know, dropping the staff and having turned into a snake, which is something God showed Moses to convince him that, yeah, it's really me, and I'm really going to be there with you. And then they're doing some of this stuff, even in the, even the first, like the, the, the Nile uh, issue, the water to blood looking. The magicians of Pharaoh's court replicated everything. And the Jews could see that. Well, and so I think there was a sense in which, yeah, there seems to be some power here, but they were very quick. For instance, early on, after Moses had initially, Moses and Aaron had initially convinced the Israelites, yes, this is God, he's with us, you know, look at the staff, just for the Israelites to convince them, 
Then, when he first goes to Pharaoh and says, let my people go, and he goes, uh, no, in fact, you guys are just whining because you don't have enough work to do. So therefore, from now on, you've got to make just as many bricks as you did make, but we're not going to provide you with the straw. You've got to go out into the fields and cut your own stubble for straw to make the bricks. That's where the expression bricks without straw comes from. Meaning, you know, I'm expected to work, and yet they're not giving me what I need to get the job done. Um, and, and they turned on Moses and said, well, thanks a lot. You know, and all they were, they were viscerally experiencing what it meant to be under the thumb of Pharaoh and his overseers. And so they were, they were slow about this. And um, they, it's almost as though they were too, too oppressed to see the miracles in it, at least initially, until they finally left. And even then, they were quick to complain about stuff when they got out of the desert. Yes? I sort of wonder what the level of knowledge of the Bible is. Is it lessening? Because I think of... Mind you, it, it was a movie, but what was the, t the Ten Commandments? Mm -hmm. Followed this fairly faithfully. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it's not to be learned as scripture, but it's a real good introduction. Well, most people still think of uh, Charlton Heston when they think of Moses. <laughs> oh, yes. Yes. And the director was God, A.C. Sabedevich. <laughs> God. But anyway, there seemed to be a sort of acceptance of it more back in the 50s when yeah. that was made, and now you don't see it now. Oh yeah, well in the 50s there was a lot more knowledge of the Bible, but uh, as well, but you're right, I agree with you. Uh, it's One more thing, and then we'll take, we will take a break. Charlton Heston, when they were filming the Ten Commandments, and he and he was reading all this stuff and studying for it and everything else, and he said, the God of the Israelites was a very bad general. Yeah. <laughs> Thinking in terms of, he may have done miraculous things to to save them, like when he led them out to the, you know, the edge of the Red Sea, but then he got them trapped there, and they didn't have any chariots, and the biggest army in the world is after him, and ah, bad general. And yet, he then did miracles to save him. So, okay, let's take a break. We will be back at 25 after. Um, we were talking about the dating. I want to make a couple of um, a couple of comments about some things, and then we've got a few more passages to look at. As I mentioned, um, William Albright. At early in the 20th century, he's the one that suggested an alternative date of the 13th century, that is the 1200s, instead of the 1400s as the entry date, and it had to do with some archaeological evidence that he found. Um, there were, there have been several things that uh, mitigated against that. Some of his archaeological evidence has proved that, you know, they found samples later of what he thought was um, indicative of the Israelites coming in that was from quite a long time earlier. Um, there's also a very famous stele, or a, a stele was a, like a pinnacle, a, a standing stone like that would be carved. What's that? Like the mine was uh, Yeah, like, you know, it's, it's like an ancient stone photo bowl kind of thing, but they would, they would write on them, and they would be usually some references to uh, kings or pharaohs or that sort of thing. Well, the Merenifta stele is a very famous one, um, and it identifies a number of different peoples that had been defeated in Canaan at one point in, in a series of battles by the Egypt, by, anyway. Um, and it specifically mentions a people called Israel. Well, the, this stele has been, um, with some confidence, dated to between 1213 and 1203 BC. Well, for the Israelites to have been as, as present and established to be recognized as a unique people and not just some tribe wandering around. So that they would have been included on this list of nations in Canaan means they had to have been there for some time in order to be established as a people. So the likelihood that they would have only come in around 1250 and this stele was only 38 years later or so is not likely. So um, there, there are other indications that probably the 15th century, that is the 1400s BC, would be the most likely date. Uh, the other date Albright suggested, but there are a number of things, and with, with good intention, and I, I don't discount him as a scholar, but some things were found after his death that seemed to mitigate against some of his conclusions on that. Okay? Um, I just wanted to make one other comment about that as we, as we move along. Uh, one other thing I might mention, because I've got, well, Let's do the crossing of the Red Sea, and then we'll talk about the population and some other things. Okay? The next great event, and I'll go back and add the Passover to, the, to this, is the crossing of the Red Sea, Exodus 14. The Israelites have left Egypt. After they leave, Moses, um, Pharaoh rather, 
realizes what he's done in telling them to leave and his grief over his son's death, and some scholars believe that son may have been Tutankhamun, um, the famous King Tut, that whether it was or not, the death of his son and everything else, he's so grief-stricken that after the Israelites leave, and before they leave, by the way, God tells them, ask your Egyptian masters for silver and gold, and loads them down. With, they load them down with golden earrings and various other things so that they plunder Egypt, it says, before they leave. They leave, and after they get out of the, the where Pharaoh was, and they're traveling toward the border of Egypt, Pharaoh has second thoughts again, that waffling thing. And he says, what have I done? I just let all of our workforce leave. And let's go back, let's go get them, bring them back. And so the Egyptian army the most significant army of its day, takes off after Moses. At some point, Moses and the Israelites look back and they realize that they're being chased by the army of Pharaoh, or Pharaoh and his army. And so there they come up against the Red Sea. I'm going to talk about Red Sea, Reed Sea in a minute. And then um, the, the army's behind them, and they're bearing down on them. And what are we going to do? Where are we going to go? And the Israelites... Already twice, I think, by this point, they've said to Moses, what have you done? You know, we could have died back in Egypt. We would have had better places to be buried if we died back there. Why did you bring us out here to die? And so we have, oh, sorry, uh, the crossing of the Red Sea. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and all that night the Lord drove, back, drove the sea back with a strong east wind and turned it into dry land. The waters were divided, and the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with a wall of water on their right, and on their left. The Egyptians pursued them, and all Pharaoh's horses and chariots and horsemen followed them into the sea. During the last watch of the night, the Lord looked down from the pillar of fire and cloud. As they, as they left from Pharaoh's presence, God preceded them, and it was in a uh, pillar of fire at night so that they had light, and a pillar of cloud at day that they were following so that they would know where to go. Um, the Lord looked down from the pillar of fire and cloud at the Egyptian army and threw it into confusion. He made the wheels of their chariots come off so that they had difficulty driving. And the Egyptians said, let's get away from the Israelites. The Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea so that the waters may flow back over the Egyptians and their chariots and horsemen. Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and at daybreak the sea went back to its place. The Egyptians were fleeing towards it, and the Lord swept them into the sea. The water flowed back and covered the chariots and horsemen, the entire army of Pharaoh that had followed the Israelites into the sea. Not one of them survived. Now, this, the indication is not that Pharaoh was with them. He sent his army into the Red Sea between the walls of water to capture the Israelites, and then God had the water flow back over them. There's not an indication that Pharaoh himself was killed here. He doesn't tell us that nor that his whole army. It says that the entire army of Pharaoh that had followed the Israelites into the sea was destroyed. So it might it, it didn't mean there no, no longer was an army in Egypt at that point. Uh, but still very, very significant in terms of what happens here. Now, several things that we can observe about this. This is one of the things that has been most challenged in terms of liberal scholars saying, yeah, not likely. One of the things that they questioned about it is that the Red Sea, as it was originally translated, is Yam Suf. Suf is actually not the word for red, it's the word for reed, as in papyrus reed. And so you'll often read nowadays, read nowadays, that people will talk about the fact that this wasn't the Red Sea, it was the Reed Sea. Well, reeds, as in papyrus or bulrushes or any of those sorts of things, don't grow in salt water. The Red Sea is salt water. <coughs> And so they, the indication has been on um, part of a lot of people, or the belief has been, that they didn't actually cross the Red Sea, but rather they crossed some fresh bo freshwater body that would have been between, you know, Sukkot, where they left in Egypt, and, um, you know, when we're, the Egyptians caught up with them. This is an image of what the Israelites might have been up against. This is, this is a... a a relief of an Egyptian war chariot, and you'll see there's more of them off here in the distance. This was the tank of its day. You know, they were fast. They were they were the thing that made the um, Egyptian army so powerful. This was the thing that was chasing the Israelites, okay. um, and scary it was. 
because it was so fast, so mobile. Um, archers in it. Uh, now, the crossing of the Red Sea. This is an image from a movie where you get the idea of the Israelites trailing across there. I'm going to talk about the number of Israelites in just a second. You, art and movie and books, novels, you know, the, the, this fascination that we've had with a large group of people having the waters part and then cross. And usually we get this idea like this of this huge body of water. Well, as I say, because Yam Suf means Reed Sea, a lot of people have said it wasn't probably the Red Sea. It was a Reed Sea, which means a fresh body of water. This is the traditional path of the Exodus. The people would have gone from Ramesses to, through Pithom and Sukkot, and then the traditional sense was that they went south and they crossed the northern tip of the Gulf of Suez, the Red Sea. Now, the, um, in the main body of the Red Sea down here, the water can be really deep, you know, like unfathomably deep, uh, and it's a very large body of salt water. Here, you know, we're not talking as far across or as deep, but it's still a significant body of water. And it, it's, because it's salt water, there are tides, you know, um, so this is the traditional view. They crossed here and they came down. This is Mara, which we'll mention in a minute, and that this is the traditional site of Mount Sinai, Jebel Musa, which means the mountain of Moses. And then later they left there, they came up here, and then they wandered around the desert for 40 years. And then back down here to Elat, and then back up through Edom and Moab and Ammon, and then crossed over under Joshua into the Holy Land. This is the traditional view. The problem is, again, this is salt water. Reeds don't grow on salt water. If it really is the Reed Sea, which is what Yam Suf means, then maybe that wasn't the body of water. Maybe it was somewhere else. Some people have proposed that maybe what it was is they crossed their series of freshwater lakes along here. The Great Bitter Lake, the Little Bitter Lake. Um, now, granted, it's not the Red Sea. It's not that big a body of water, but God can do the miracle of parting the water, then he can cause the water of a, a good-sized lake, like the Great Bitter Lake, to overflow the Israelites as well. Some people have suggested that they would have gone up here. This is Lake Sirbonus, which is actually more of a lagoon. And that maybe they went there, and that that's where the parting happened, in which case maybe Jebel Halal is the, uh, the site of Sinai, instead of Jebel Musa down here. So, and some people have said they just crossed straight over, you know, they made a straight run for it across the wilderness of Paran, and, you know, so there are different ideas as to what's happening here. Part of it has to do with what, with what is the Yan Suf. There's one theory which I find really fascinating, and there's claims by people that they have evidence for this. And I've seen some of the videotapes of supposed chariot wheels that are in the Gulf of Aqaba. Again, Red Sea down here, this is the Gulf of Suez. They would have come out of Egypt, this is Egypt over here, come out of here, and instead of crossing here or one of these lakes and then heading straight down here, the, down here is where um, Jebel Musa, the traditional site, which Helen, St. Helena identified, Constantine's mother, then if they cut across and then came here to Nueva and then crossed the Gulf of Aqaba, and they claim that they have found, uh, claim, you know, they have found, whether the authenticity of them, some people question. There are columns here. This is a beach, actually. And north of here is what would have, it was an Egyptian fort. We're told that they were near Migdal. Migdal means the tower. <coughs> well, there was a tower. What the equivalent of what we would think of as three stories. It was a large Egyptian uh, fort there. South of that, there are mountains. It talks about them being hot, um, being trapped in the wilderness. Well, from uh, Itam here, from about here on, there is a wadi. A wadi is a dry riverbed that has steep mountains on each side. It's really the only way to get through this area, to get down here to the Gulf of Aqaba. But once you enter it, you can't get out of it. You either turn around and go back the way you came, or you go out the other end, which brings you out right here, and no place to go from there. So, one of the theories is, and they, they say that they have found Bones and chariot wheels um, covering about a mile and a half underneath, uh, uh, underwater, and, they, and I've seen some of the videos, um, here in the Gulf of Aqaba. That would mean if they crossed over here, then Mount Sinai must be over here. And again, the question is, is this Midian or is Midian over here? Into, this is the Sinai Peninsula that sticks down here to the Red Sea. This is Saudi Arabia. 
this is Egypt. The suggestion by some people is that Jabal al is Mount Sinai. It's the, there are references to the fact that the God descended on the, on the top of Mount Sinai. And again, it, it, somebody just decided this mountain down here, which is Jebel Musa, was Mount Sinai. It's not a, you know, we have no evidence for that. We have no maps. There are some interesting things. They found some, some old maps that this place here in the Weba is actually got a longer name, which translates as Moses' parted water. And so there's other bit, and you know, that's on some maps, some very ancient maps. So there's other indications that suggest this might be true. Um, and the, as I started to say, um, the Jabal Alaz, the whole top of it is black. And it looks scorched. The stone is black. And the idea it says in, in, you know, that God descended on the top of the mountain in fire. And so this idea that the whole top of the mountain would be black. So there are people who hold very strongly that this was where they really did cross the Red Sea in terms of the Gulf of Aqaba being part of the Red Sea. It doesn't explain Yam Suf, if Suf only means read, but that's not enough evidence to, you know, to throw everything else out to suggest. Now, again, some conservative scholars would be quick to say that even if it does mean read sea, if it does mean a freshwater body of water, that doesn't mean that God could not still have miraculously acted. Okay? That, that's, but there's some fascinating stuff in there, and someday we may figure that out. But there, there are a number of pieces of this that does make it sound accurate to the description in Scripture, more so than any of these others. And as I say, other than St. Helena saying she had a vision, there's no indication for sure that Mount Sinai down here really is Mount Sinai. The uh, Jalal Musa, yes? I've got a question and a comment. The uh, question is... Um, I don't remember the man's name who, who led this archaeological uh, survey. Oh, yeah. um, but um, why didn't they t bring up those wheels and test them? I mean, that, that's the question. My comment, my comment is, you know, when you, when you talk about the Sea of Reeds, I find it kind of difficult to believe that reeds that cannot grow in depth of oceans no, it's in salt water. That's the issue. It's not depth. It's well, even if it, if, it, if it's fresh water, it still reeds don't grow in water that is of a depth sufficient to drown an army. How can you drown in a in a sea of reeds? Well, some of these freshwater lakes up here are fairly large. Okay, and the reeds grow along the edge. Okay, so it would just be named exactly. It's just the name for it. It's a sea of reeds because. There's all these bulrushes, there's all these, you know, the things okay. that parchment's made of. Whereas you don't find those along here because they don't grow in or around salt water. All right? and, but again, that, that's, that's a factoid. Right? There's, there's no museum pieces or anything left of what their archaeologists are claiming? There's video of this stuff. Um, I don't know that they, I don't know whether they do have actual pieces they brought up or not. But there are divers and, you know, video that they've taken in, underneath and that sort of stuff. And they do have the pillars. In fact, the pillar is on each side, and there's one on each side, um, and one on the Arabian side, and that's one of the things that complicates is that the Arabians are not, the, the people of Saudi Arabia are not anxious for any of the story of the Jewish people to be verified. So they, don't, they don't really allow much going on over here, okay? Um, but these columns uh, were, the one that had, one of them was washed, was down, it was washed clean, so that the writing wasn't in, but the one that did have writing on it when they first recorded all this stuff, it said that it was a column put up by Solomon to acknowledge the crossing, you know, the crossing by Moses. Hmm. That doesn't, we don't have access to that anymore. Mary, first. Uh, I think you just answered my question. Okay. That they, they have difficulty accessing that side. Right. Well, and the guy who first claimed to have found this stuff, and there have been other people involved in this since, his name was Ronald Wyatt. He and his two sons, because they couldn't get a visa to get into Saudi Arabia to check this out, they um, walked in, and this is, 25 years ago, they, they, they crossed into Saudi Arabia without permission and they were arrested for not having visas and accused of being spies and, and sentenced to death. They were in prison for 78 days and thought they were going to be executed and then they were finally released. Okay, so yeah, there's been, there's been resistance on the part of Saudi Arabia to deal with any of this, just as there has been for many years for, by Turkey to get into the area where supposedly the Noah's Ark is. You know, these are... Muslim countries, and we're trying to prove Jewish and Christian ideas that they're not real keen on us doing that. Yes? Uh, is there any way we can access this video? 
that yeah. you were speaking yeah. of. Yeah, it's right there, arcdiscovery.com. Arc oh. Now, and I'll tell you that some, the, some of the ideas are interesting. Some of the videos and other images are fascinating. They don't do a very professional job of presenting it. Mm -hmm. It's kind of cheesy. Oh. And so I, I'm not selling this to you as the answer. I'm just giving, this, giving you this as an idea that there are many different interpretations. And we don't actually know. The things that people, most people think they do know, like they go here and they pay for a tour to take them to Mount Sinai, Jebel Musa, and we don't, you know, somebody just decided that. You know, in some ways, that's almost as bad as people just deciding that this stuff couldn't have been written in the 1400s. It had been written in the 6th century BC, okay? So, um, you get the idea from that. I want to do a couple of other quick passages, and then I want to talk a little bit about, the, well, let me talk about the population thing first, because that's related to this. Scripture says, as it's usually translated at least, that there were 600,000 Israelites that came out of Egypt. In fact, uh, it generally says 600,000, and then we have a passage in Numbers which specifically identifies it, oh, where did that go? Um, specifically identifies it as being 603,000 something. And that was men, right? Was men. Of men, and it, it's 603,550. Uh, and that was just the men, which means if you count the women and the children and the, you know, the other hangers-on, it would have been somewhere between 2 million and 2.5 and million people. Well, the whole population of Egypt, one of the great countries of the world then, was only 3 to 3.5 million. Um, it has been observed that if you took 2 million people um, and had them walking 10 abreast, 10 wide, it would stretch out 150 miles. Um, when they talk about 603,000 men defined as men capable of fighting, a big army, the biggest armies, the Hittites and folks back then, 40,000 to 60,000 was a huge army. If the Israelites had, had 603,000 men in arms, which is what it's talking about, they could have kicked Pharaoh's butt. Okay? The idea of them being captive would not have been an issue. Because there's no way Pharaoh's army was ever anywhere close to that big. All right? Now, um, there have been several attempts to try to explain how this could be legitimately. The word that is translated at, the Hebrew word that's translated thousand is helep. Well, the word helep in other places is translated as family. For instance, um, in, let me find the reference here. In Judges 6.15, my clan, or family, which is the same word, Helet, is the weakest in Manassas. And it talks also about, in Numbers 116, the heads of the clans, or Helet, of Israel. Now, if, if that word is not intended to be translated thousand, instead it's intended to be translated um, family or tribe or clan, then we're <coughs> probably looking at one or two percent of the 600,000. We're looking at somewhere closer to 10,000 which would make a lot more sense in terms of the size of populations back then. It doesn't really matter, which is true, in terms of God acting miraculously. But it, it, it is, we also, we have to think about these things because the rest of the world looks at us and goes, you like, right? You believe 603,550 men plus women and children traipsed out across the desert? Well, some of the liberal scholars would say, obviously that didn't happen. There is no record of anything like that happening in all of the records of Egypt, because Egypt kept a lot of written stuff. Well, what pharaoh in his right mind would have had them keep records of him having been humiliated and having all of his workforce leave? You know, they were very quick to get rid of anything they didn't like. You know, a new pharaoh would come on and disagree with the old pharaoh. Um, for instance, Akhenaten was one of the pharaohs, and he advocated monotheism. He advocated belief in one god, Aten. Well, he ended up being hated by the priests who liked the idea that they had a really cushy job worshiping a lot of different gods. And so there was a rebellion against Akhenaten, and when he was finally deposed, they went back and they destroyed every record of anything having to do with him. It was a long, long time before they found any reference to Akhenaten. And, the, you know, all these statues, you know, you get up all these things. The best they have of him are broken pieces because they destroyed all the statues. Well, what pharaoh is going to keep the records of him having been humiliated by a bunch of slaves who then marched out, and when he tried to stop them, they defeated him in battle? They didn't keep records of that kind of thing. So there's no real indication of that. But the idea of the number, there may be legitimate explanations for why that number seems 
quite extraordinarily large by any record, uh, without diminishing the, the veracity of the scripture. It may simply be a word translation question. But then there are others. Gleason Archer is a conservative scholar who says um, that, well, we do have pharaohs saying the Israelites are getting so numerous that they're scaring me. Okay. And there was a time in Rome, as I've said several times in the other class, where two out of every three people in the, in the, in the city of Rome were slaves. So you could have a slave population equal to or larger than the population of free people. You also have the case that all of the gold and silver and stuff that they gave the Israelites as they left, when the Israelites later, um, the temple of Solomon was built and the people brought their gold, it was several tons of gold. Well, the only place they would have gotten gold is if they still had it from when the Egyptians gave it to them, because they don't mine gold in Israel. And so the idea that all the individuals had all of this gold, it would suggest that it was passed down to them, and there must have been a lot of people to have tons of gold that they carried out in earrings and nose rings. So there's ways you can argue that that number, you know, the high number sounds not unreasonable, too. We don't really know. But you need to know that sometimes that question gets asked. And there may be very legitimate explanations for it. Okay? Question? Marvin. They went in, 69 people, with Joseph, including his wife and his two children. Right. 69, and 400 years later, there were... Two million. We want to do like the rats. How fast can they populate, and how many will survive? And that's another thing is they Some, said uh, they couldn't really reproduce that fast. Yeah, I, and then they went to when there's twelve moms. Wow, twelve moms. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you do again. This idea that they would stretch out ten people wide for 150 miles strains strains credibility. You but know, go 50 people wide. Yeah, still too long. Uh, <laughs> exactly. How, and what? And they're talking about walking through wadis and you know across the desert and everything else. How how much can you do, Becky? Well, I mean, feeding those would be a. You know, I've seen where they they talk a lot about how it was a common thing that if they if they was victorious over a people, they would wipe out their records. It was mm -hmm. part of their defeat was right. to wipe out everything. You know, and they were trying to uh, prove later that the house of David didn't even exist. Well, they, some woman in the field found a, you know, a tablet that at the bottom of it, it was, well, it was a king that was bragging on all his victories, and he said, and the house of David was shorn. You know, okay. so apparently if, if they didn't want anything said, of, you know, about any people, they right. would just... Why got their name on everything? And that's what I was saying, is that the fact that there are no records in Egypt, which some scholars say is dem demonstrates the fact it didn't happen, that was common. It was not, it was, right. you wouldn't leave record of a defeat, or you wouldn't, you would never have recorded a defeat. So, okay, a couple more passages I want to look at. We've only got a few more minutes. These have to do with God's continuing provision in the desert. Once they, they cross the Red Sea, there's no longer a problem with Pharaoh. They're no longer in territory that's controlled by a Pharaoh. And that's another... Another thing that suggests that maybe Midian was in Saudi Arabia because the Egyptians still controlled the Sinai Peninsula. That was all still their territory. They, it wasn't part of Egypt, the country, but they controlled it all. They did not control Saudi Arabia, and it's possible that was Midian because they didn't control Midian. Okay, so Exodus 16, and I've chopped some pieces here to get the whole thing in. In the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. Okay, God has just parted the Red Sea. And they crossed on dry land, and then he destroyed the pharaohs. The first thing they do is start griping about stuff. Okay. I think they were Americans. <laughs> In the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. There we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted. But you have brought us out into the desert to starve this entire assembly to death. Then the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. In between here, by the way, Moses, you know, Moses is going to God and saying, Would you help me with these people? The Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. So Moses and Aaron said to all the Israelites, In the evening you will know that it was the Lord who brought you out of Egypt. This is another one of those you will know passages. And in the morning you will see the glory of the Lord, because he has heard your grumbling against him. Who are we, that is Moses and Aaron, that you should grumble against us? Moses also said, You will know that it was the Lord when he gives you meat to eat in the evening and all the bread you want in the morning because he has heard your grumbling against him. Who are we? You are not grumbling against us, but against the Lord. 
The Lord said to Moses, I have heard the grumbling of the Israelites. Tell them at twilight you will eat meat, and in the morning you will be filled with bread, and then you will know that I am the Lord your God. That evening quail came and covered the camp. And in the morning there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the dew was gone, thin flakes like frost on the ground appeared on the desert floor. When the Israelites saw it, they said to each other, What is it? For they did not know what it was. Moses said to them, It is the bread the Lord has given you to eat. What is it in Hebrew? Sounds like manna. So that's why they called it manna. It means, what is this? Um, we still don't know what manna was. There's a suggestion that insects that were common in that part of the world would secrete uh, a material that when it dried could be ground up into something like flour. And, uh, you know, like shellac is the secretion of insects except this was edible, um, a similar kind of thing like that. And that's why there would be a dew, what looked like a liquid, but then when it dried, it was something they could collect, and it had nutritional value to it. They weren't thrilled about it after eating it for several years, but it sustained them, okay? Um, that was the bread that the Lord gave them to eat. He did provide for them, even though they griped and grumbled and immediately forgot the miraculous things he had done for them. And he continued to provide. Did I just look at that? Mm -hmm. I what I did. You had the um, water of Mara. Oh, okay, well, let's look at the uh, Mara. Yeah. Um, this is actually, yeah, before the other piece. Then Moses led Israel from the Red Sea when they went into the desert of Shur. For three days they traveled in the desert without finding water. For when they came to Mara, they could not drink its water because it was bitter. That is why the place is called Mara which means bitter in Hebrew. So the people grumbled against Moses, saying, What are we to drink? Then Moses cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a piece of wood. He threw it into the water, and the water became fit to drink. There the Lord issued a ruling and instruction for them and put them to the test. He said, If you listen carefully to the Lord your God and do what is right in his eyes, if you pay attention to his commands and keep all his decrees, I will not bring on you any of the diseases I brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. Then they came to Elam, where there were 12 springs and 70 palm trees, and they camped there near the water. There still is an area where there are a lot more than 70 palm trees now, but there are 12 wells in one location that some people say was a route that they took. Um, it's interesting here that God says to the Israelites, you remember all those bad things I did to the Egyptians? Well, you better act right, or the same things could happen to you. That's basically what God is saying. Don't forget, I'm the one that brought that on the Egyptians, and you really do not want to make me your enemy. But I love you. You're my chosen people. And I don't plan on doing that, but don't push your luck, is what he's saying. Bob? Verse 26. Is that before Sinai or after Sinai? Um, if it was before Sinai, what, what commands and decrees do they have to keep? Well, he's setting them up for it, I think. He's saying, okay, I'm going to give you instructions as we go along. And when I give you instructions, when I give you commands, you better be obedient to them, because if you don't, then don't forget what I did to the Egyptians. You could suffer as well. So he has not given them the instructions yet, but he's about to. They're just leading up to that. Then, and sorry I got those out of order, then we have the um, quail and manic in the wilderness. And then, um, okay, 17. My notes are all messed up here. God continues to provide. The whole Israelite community set out from the desert of Sin, traveling from place to place as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink, so they quarreled with Moses, give us water to drink. There's another, the same problem again. Moses replied, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you put the Lord to the test? Why are you whining? <laughs> but the people were thirsty for water there, and they grumbled against Moses. They said, why did you bring us up out of Egypt to make us and our children and livestock die of thirst? Then Moses cried out to the Lord, What am I to do with these people? They are almost ready to stone me. The Lord answered Moses, Go out in front of the people. Take with you some of the elders of Israel, and take in your hand the staff by which you struck the Nile, and go. I will stand there before you by the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock, and water will come out of it for the people to drink. So Moses did this in the sight of the elders of Israel, and he called the place Massa and Meribah, because the Israelites quarreled, and because they tested the Lord, saying, is the Lord among us or not? Masa and Meribah uh, mean tested and quarreled. Okay. And one last passage. 
The first battle that the Israelites have to fight after they get out of Egypt, there was a nomadic people who were a warrior people. They, they preyed on other groups called the Amalekites. And they were all, they're always a bad guy in the scripture. The Amalekites came and attacked the Israelites at Rephidim. Moses said to Joshua, choose some of our men and go out to fight the Amalekites. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hands. The staff of God was the staff that he had done all the, the power, powerful miracles through. To change the Nile, to bring water out of the rock, everything else. That staff was very important. So Moses fought the Amalekites as Moses had so Joshua fought the Amalekites as Moses had ordered, and Moses, Aaron, and Hur went to the top of the hill. As long as Moses held up his hands, the Israelites were winning. But whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites were winning. When Moses' hands grew tired, they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. Aaron and Hur held his hands up, one on one side, one on the other, so that his hands remained steady till sunset. So Joshua overcame the Amalekite army with the sword. Then the Lord said to Moses, Write this on a scroll as something to be remembered and make sure that Joshua hears it, because I will completely blot out the name of Amalek from under heaven. Moses built an altar and called it, The Lord is my banner. He said, Because hands were lifted up against the throne of God, the Lord will be at war against the Amalekites from generation to generation. We have no record. I mean, there's mention of the Amalekites in Scripture, but it's not like it's passed down to modern times. We have no idea what happened to them. Um, so here, God continued to provide, and it's interesting that God still chose to use Moses as the vehicle by which he blessed the people. And clearly God wanted the Israelites, and it may be because they were griping at Moses so much, God makes a point of, of demonstrating that it is through Moses that he will act. As long as Moses' hands are held up, you guys win. If Moses falls down on the job, you guys lose. So don't mess with Moses. He's important to you. He is the one through whom I am choosing to work. Make no mistake. It's also true that God had other people there to help lift up Moses' arms. He had helpers to make sure he was available to do the job that God called him to do. Yeah, yes. I was just going to mention about a hymn that says Aaron and right. held up the arms yeah. and and other people. That one person shouldn't be doing it alone. There's going to need to be other people there. So one last thing I want to say is there are major themes that we find in Exodus. Themes that, similar to what we talked about last week in Genesis, we will find reflected all the way through to the New Testament. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these today. But election, the idea that God had chosen or elected the Jewish people, starting with Abraham as his special chosen people. And... He heard the cries of the Israelites, they were his people, and he chose to do something about it. So he's affirming their election. He also is both affirming the original covenant promise that he started with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then, next week, we will see he re-establishes his covenant in even a more specific way with Moses, or through Moses, to the Israelites. We have the theme of salvation and deliverance, that God delivered the Israelites from captivity in Egypt from slavery. He saved them from that. He saved them from Pharaoh and the threat of Pharaoh's armies when they were at the edge of the Red Sea. We also had the theophany or presence of God. Obviously, God. Uh, there was a theophany when God appeared in the burning bush. He made his presence known to Moses. Um, he made his presence known, 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 known to Pharaoh as well as to the Israelites through the works that he did. That, those were examples. The plagues, even, are an example of a theophany. God made his presence known through the miraculous acts that he worked. And then the presence in the column of cloud at night, or in the day, in the column of fire at night, that God allowed his presence to be there with them in a visible way. We will have even more of the presence of God when we get into the Sinai Covenant next week, and we hear about God's desire this whole, the whole thing, the whole Exodus story, and then the covenant of Sinai was God's way of saying, I want you to be more aware of my presence with you. And that leads to the building of the tabernacle and of the, you know, of the, the idea that this was a location where God could come in contact with his people. It was literally God's throne on earth. It was his home on earth. And that later was then replicated in large scale in the temple in Jerusalem, but it was a sign of the presence of God in their midst, which is why when the tabernacle, we'll talk about next week, was, was created, the, the different clans of the people of Israel were to camp around it. It was to be their center. 
And there's very important significance to that. And then finally, obviously, God's protection. He would not leave them unprotected, no matter how strong the enemy was or how threatened they were. God, now he sometimes made them, you know, made them feel his need. I think sometimes God doesn't immediately demonstrate his protection because he wants us to be sure that it is him who's doing it and not just us. And so we sometimes have to go right to the edge before he pulls us back. But he demonstrated his protection for us in that. All of these themes carry through all the way to the New Testament. And we see the evidence of election, covenant, salvation, deliverance, the presence of God, particularly in the incarnation, and of God's protection for his people, all the way through the story of God's relationship with humanity. Okay? Any questions? Comments? Have a good trip. Thank you. We will be back next Tuesday. So this.